Okay, so we can get started. I think we probably have a full class as of now. Everyone's trickling in. Um, nailing the job. Buckle up and get ready to board the success train. You miss 100% of the shots you don't take. A great quote from Michael Scott. Um, I actually built out this training two years ago, maybe three years, no, two years ago, July 2018. Um, really because I felt like there was so much I didn't know when starting at my first job that no one really taught me. And it really came down to like those little nitty gritty things, um, which we'll get into, but like how to take notes, how to lead a meeting, um, kind of more of these ethereal skills that you don't get kind of core instruction on. Um, as you get your jobs, you'll find that these companies will pay a lot of money to train you on how to build out an Excel and how to build out a good model and how to, you know, build out, a, you know, a presentation per se. Um, but there are some little things that I noticed that were missing that would really add as a good advantage um, when, you know, doing a, when doing your work efficiently um, or anything along those lines. So I built out this training with that in mind. Um, quickly go to the next slide here. We've basically bucketed this into two main skills or categories. Uh, the first is around hard skills development. So this is kind of that note taking, effective communication, organizing files, those types of skills. Uh, the second main bucket is soft. Uh, so how to manage up at work, how to ensure you're getting a good work-life balance, and then of course, attitude. We wanna close the session with uh, top five tips from me and Peter's experience uh, working for three to four years now um, for success. And then we'll close with 10 minutes for questions. Um, oh, I also missed the mission, but our mission is to ensure that you leave this session with a new skill set that will help you hit the ground running at your first job. Um, but before all of that, let's do a brief round of introductions. My name is Liam Gallagher. Um, if you don't already know that, I am the conference director for this year's conference. And I'm currently employed at a tech startup called Wonderkind. Um, they sell software. <laughs> and I've been there for less than one year, maybe five months. Um, I'm a client partnerships rep, which basically means I spend my days talking to people <laughs> and managing partnerships. And I live in New York City. I went to Wake Forest University, majored in finance. All that should be old news. My favorite quote ever is, nothing is at last sacred but the integrity of your own mind by Ralph Waldo Emerson. Uh, Peter, do you want to give a brief intro? Yeah, sure thing. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Peter. I uh, currently work at BCG, um, Boston Consulting Group. I've been there for just over two years. I'm a consultant there now. Um, still in Los Angeles, I went to USC uh, here in LA, and then I stayed out here on the West Coast um, to start my job here. And I actually came from an engineering background. Thought I was going to go into the energy industry and oil, but I quickly pivoted and went into consulting instead. Um, my favorite quote is, I feel like I see this everywhere, but it says it doesn't matter where you came from, all that matters is where you're going. Um, I feel like I see this all over LinkedIn or some variation of this. And I resonate with it because during my first years, I had a little bit of imposter syndrome in the consulting world, um, thinking why am I here as an engineer, non-traditional background, um, which is something you may deal with when you go into your first job, but with these tips and, you know, Get, gaining confidence on the job, you can quickly overcome that. And it doesn't really matter what your past is, just matters how well you're doing your job now and where you want to go, so. Awesome. Thanks, Peter. Um, one other thing I'll quickly say before we dive in is please feel free to interrupt us with questions. Um, I know it's a little different this year, but I'm actively gonna be watching this chat. So as they come to mind, please feel, feel free to, to type them in there. Um, we do change topics a lot throughout this presentation, so I want to make sure we're addressing them in a timely manner. But all right, I'll kick us off um, with hard skills um, and really start with note taking. So as a first year analyst, um, this will probably be one of your biggest responsibilities. Um, not actually, but probably your most, one of the most important ones because everyone on your team all the senior leaders will actually use you or you know, rely on you to take effective and good notes. Um, I can't tell you the amount of times um, that I was a business analyst and responsible for being the only one in the meeting taking notes and then uh, making them uh, segmented afterwards and then sending them out. 
um, it's really important that these end up looking and feeling really good. So I wanted to provide a little bit of um, some advice on how I feel great notes look and are presented. So obviously you've learned this through grade school, but the first thing you wanna do is make sure that all of your header and meeting information is accurate and at the top of the screen. Uh, you wanna write out the meeting title, date, time, anyone that was in attendance and other important factors that might be relevant. Uh, this information will help you to identify notes from a specific meeting later on and keep using information that might prove to be important, as in like someone wasn't actually in that meeting um, when someone said they were. So the next section you want to really do a uh, good job at doing is looking through your general notes and picking out anything that was key or really important for people to hear. So this is the any of those key takeaways that important dates, important agenda items that are coming up, anything that or decisions that were made that will then kind of change the course of the work stream or the project after that meeting. Um, so this is what the senior leadership will want to look at and really quickly. And if you bring that all to the top, they don't have to spend a lot of time going through your more detailed notes and get all the pieces of information they actually want and need right away. And they'll really thank you for it. The next section is any of those action items. So what you'll find very quickly is that in every meeting, there's action items um, when you need it. So either Jamie has to update a certain uh, number of slides or Nick has to tell the client something, whatever that might be, it, it comes really handy to then categorize those action items in one place right after the key takeaways. Um, and try to be uh, detailed, but also a little bit concise in this. You wanna make sure all the important pieces are there, but it's not like a paragraph that they have to read through. Again, emphasis on efficiency, um, but without missing any of those important uh, pieces of information. And then finally, you close with the general notes. So this is pretty much all of the other notes that were taken during the meeting that didn't deem to be important enough to be included in the takeaways and weren't really actionable. Um, you wanna, of course, make these brief, uh, make them bulleted, and it depends on you. Sometimes people will, will structure these based off of who provided that input. Other ones will categorize them based off of the type of work stream they're related to, or project they're related to. Um, but either way, these shouldn't ever really be looked at because you've done such a good job up front at uh, dispelling the most important information. Um, so I see a message, a question in the chat, Mifundo, great to hear from you. Is the idea that you want to take these notes and keep them till asked, or should you make it a habit and send them out to your team before you're asked? Great question. I usually do send them out before I'm asked. Um, what this does is allows for a record. If your team doesn't need them, it's fine. They'll just ignore the email, open it, briefly look at it and move on. Um, so it's not really that much of a burden. Uh, but what it does do is allow them to come back to that um, when they do need it later on and really see how their memory really lines up to what happened. So I kind of err on the side of do send it out. Um, it's really not that much harm done. Um, but Peter, what's your perspective? Yeah, I, I'd say like erring on the side of sending out is fine. I think it's also play by ear and kind of how your, um, whatever you're working on uh, in your industry is, 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 uh, is it, if it's appropriate. So for example, in consulting, sometimes we do due diligences, which is uh, when we're evaluating a company for a private equity firm and doing that requires 40 plus expert interviews. And I can tell you my manager doesn't want to see 40 interview notes because they can't spend that time. That's my job to make sure it's all tabulated, but what they want to see are those key takeaways. So instead of sending the full notes, you can send just the key takeaways and key learnings that will help progress the project, um, which is really important. So just keeping your manager informed. So you can kind of play it by ear based on like how the project or whatever you're working on is going. And then actually another question for you, Peter, by Abe, how did you make sure that you got a great consulting job with your engineering background, physics student here? Um, yeah, I think it's to get the job itself is through networking and the conference like this and, and whatnot. So I can talk more offline about that, but doing great in consulting itself, I think is actually, um, this is what I learned as I was going through essentially my imposter syndrome is that everyone kind of comes from different backgrounds 
um, whether it be there's some might be some doctors, there might be some lawyers, there's also business people and there's engineers. And when you just get into your first job, it's so different than the academic world. So you just really have to put your head down and really dive in with like a growth mindset, feeling that, you know, you want to take on the challenge and you want to learn. And I think as long as you put that grit in and you follow some best practices like we're going to go over today, I think you'll learn really quickly and you'll eventually be really good in the consulting job. So um, wouldn't worry too much about the background itself. Great. And then Benny, how do you determine what is a key takeaway or not if you just started the job? Um, that's a good question. It can be tricky when you first start to figure out what is kind of the most important information. I will err on the side of if it is a decision that impacts the course of the project or the course of the work stream, that's usually a key takeaway. And if something changes that was, you know, kind of set in stone prior, that's a big change or even a minor change, that's probably a key takeaway. And then anything about dates um, or um, minute details that would otherwise be overlooked could sometimes be considered a key takeaway if it does have a big impact on things. So that's my general opinion there. Um, Peter, any thoughts? No, I think that makes sense. Um, I think a lot of these tips, like they seem like pretty set in stone as we're giving them, but they do take context with what you're working on to determine what is really key for the manager to know and what not. And I think you'll start to get the ropes of that in your first six months, so. Great. Okay, Peter, do you wanna? Yeah. So I'll go over uh, communication. I'm excited to go over this one because I literally think this is the most important skill <laughs> you will learn and you'll continue to learn through your whole career. I know uh, it took me a while to figure out how to be an effective communicator um, for the first two years and I'm still growing into it. I know my mentors and managers are still growing into it as well. Um, so essentially the reason why it's really important is you can do all the analysis or think about a great strategy idea for the client but if you can't communicate that well to your manager to make sure they understand it or more importantly to the client who is going to accept whatever you're working on for them then it's going to go off the rails and they're probably not going to accept it because they won't be able to understand they'll be questioning so that's why this is really important and so we'll start off today by going over emails and then powerpoint which will be the basis of your life for the next two years um, and mostly what you're doing um, so it's a good starting point we can go into the emails and liam Oh, yeah, sorry. No worries. All right, so we'll go over the parts of the email here and tell you what kind of is helpful to write in a to, to write an effective email. Um, obviously, at the start, you want to introduce uh, uh, the person that you're addressing. So I call it kind of like a friendly formal, you can say hi, but make sure you uh, say the client's name. And then you can always start off with a nice greeting, always nice to start off positive, um, and not set off a bad mood. Then if we go into the body of the email, um, there are a couple key things um, here. Liam, could you advance? Gracias. Um, so in the, in the body of the email, um, there's a couple of things I wanna point out here. One and the most important thing is to make sure you're starting with the most important information first. Um, a lot of the times managers or the clients have so many emails to get through on their computer or they're reading it on their mobile. So they're probably not going to read your full email and you want to make sure they get the point that you need to get across and can respond to that. So here, what they did is they want to say, uh, you know, when you return from PTO, there's three things I want to inform you about. And those are the bullets. And then I want to have a meeting. That's the next sentence bolded. Um, so if Cindy just reads this email and all that's all that she reads, then she should be probably good to go. Uh, another helpful tip here too, is to either use bulleted lists when it makes sense, so it's really easy to scan, and use coloring, highlighting, bolding whenever possible, but don't overload it so that you draw their eyes to where they need to look. I use this all the time in emails and it really makes a difference. And then lastly, I'd say, you see this kind of paragraph at the end, there's like about four sentences there. I try and keep the paragraphs really brief, maybe three sentences max. No details are gonna be lost if you're trying to read a full paragraph. Um, and it just makes it easy to scan through when it's broken up a lot and it helps you keep to the point. So um, would recommend keeping it really short and concise. 
And then the conclusion, I just say, you wanna make sure you're um, offering yourself up for any questions, something like happy to chat live if helpful for them to give you a call. That's always good to build relationships, especially with the client. Um, so uh, just making sure that you know, you're opening yourself up to, for them to clarify if needed and not cutting off the communication. All right, and then signature, you'll probably have that preloaded. Um, a couple other things is like, if you have long website addresses, link it in the Word um, so it doesn't become uh, wieldy. And if you're using a listserv, make sure to use BCC so you don't start a huge reply all thread accidentally, because that can be pretty embarrassing. Um, and yeah, I just say like that friendly formal tone is really important. You don't want to use slang. Um, and when you're writing in an email to a client, you're probably going to be a little bit more formal and build out your points rather than if you were just emailing a friend or your manager on a, with a one-liner um, response um, because you want to you know, maintain a formal relationship with them. All right, in PowerPoints, I think Brandon also had a question on any rules on using exclamation marks. Uh, honestly, it's personal preference. Um, it's, I'd say probably in your first emails, you probably want to be more formal, err on the side of formal, not use them. But as you build a client relationship or as you build your relationship with your manager, um, depending on how that relationship is, you can use them then. Um, but usually for me, that's like two to three months into a project where I know the client really well. Yeah, I would exactly agree with what Peter just said. Um, I like using exclamation points, but only after I've built up that personal relationship to where they know who I am, they kind of know my personality. Um, I might use it in an intro email, but I do think it comes off a little cheeky or you know unprofessional if you don't actually have that relationship up front. Um, again, it's a little different when it's an internal team versus a client. Internal teams are usually much more informal, so exclamation points and anything like that is fine. Um, but when you talk to clients, I think that's kind of the frame of reference that Peter and I are, are coming at this with. Yeah. And I'd say also like a helpful tip too, is when you first start your job, um, this might sound like really nitty gritty, but like you can draft an email and send it to your manager before sending it off to a client and just run it past them and say, Hey, does this look good? Can I send it? They'll appreciate that because they don't want you screwing up a relationship that they've built um, and might help you along the way, giving feedback and making sure you're writing effective emails. Um, so sometimes I still even do that today, um, with new client relationships. So something to keep in mind in case you want to run it past before uh, sending. Okay. So PowerPoints, um, the other bulk of your job, probably. So in a PowerPoint, there's essentially three parts here. First is the title. The title should essentially be an active sentence that tells the message that, uh, the story that you want to tell. Think of it as if an executive is reading your deck and all they scan is a title, they'll get the message you want to take and can move on to the next slide. That's what you want to kind of put in the title. So here they're just saying real estate, fleet, facility management, et cetera, represents more than 8% of the total spend. That must be pretty important to their analysis. Um, then if we go into the body, well, actually, uh, if you could advance Liam to do all the parts. Um, Subtitle, I don't really use this too much, but it just depends on your firm's preferences. Um, the body is where you put all the details that you need to support the analysis. And when I say all the details, meaning enough detail support them to support the message, but not to overwhelm anyone reading the, reading the slide. Um, so here they have a couple data visualizations. You might have bullet points, building out whatever you're trying to convey. Um, but just making sure that it's clear, concise to the point and not overwhelming to um, the, the person reading, which will take practice. Um, a couple other things that are really important is, you know, formatting. Uh, you want to make sure the slide looks pretty so that people don't get anchored on why is this box uh, like off kilter or unaligned and then that destroys your whole message when you're presenting. I've seen it happen before. So you want to make sure everything's aligned. You want to make sure the, the text sizes are um, the font sizes are uh, consistent throughout and the colors uh, match and are consistent throughout and are neutral to not be so egregious. Um, and then you can add a conclusion at the end. I, I think this is also firm preference. I personally don't do it at BCG, but if there is 
something really key that you want someone to take away, um, then you can put it in a call up box at the bottom or to the right, just to make sure they're really driving home the point. All right. And then, um, yeah, I'd say a lot other important points are you'll have an icon library to use, which will be more professional than uh, pulling in any icon uh, clip art. Um, any detailed slides with a lot of data that is really hard to read, likely for the appendix. Um, you don't want to put that in your main story. And then uh, trackers are something like you can put at the right hand uh, top of the slide to help kind of tie the story together because you might have 50 page slide decks in it will be kind of hard to make sure people are following. So that's another useful tool. Great. Thanks, Peter. I think there is a question in the chat. Yeah. So if you send an email and actually put the wrong name at the top, especially if it was obviously something that could be sent to multiple people, is there a procedure you recommend? Um, this, this, yeah, do you want to make that, Peter? This is funny because I actually did this in my first six months. I was, <laughs> I, was e I was, I was, I was trying to email my manager and I about and talking about the client we were working with. And I accidentally addressed it like the actual email to the client. It was like late on Friday. I had no sleep. It was like a bad kind of thing, but it actually ironed out over well. Um, I think I wouldn't try to do this uh, if I'm understanding this question correctly. And there's also tips to help you like alleviate that. So if you put like a stopper on your outbox, you can put a delay on sending messages, like a minute or two minute delay. Um, so that in case you want to look back at the email, you can fix a lot of things. And I've, I use that a lot. So um, I think that, I hope that answered the question. Unless you yeah. have to clear. I would just say, no, I think that was great, Peter. I would just say like, I, <laughs> managing my full-time job in this conference, uh, I sometimes don't do this, but you should really get in the habit of taking two seconds or three seconds after you've written an email to reread it every single time it helps it yeah it's like the most important thing and not only does it help when to make sure you said the right name um but also just to fix spelling errors and uh grammar mistakes and if you reread it you're almost like oh i can make this so much clearer by deleting this whole other sentence or i should just bullet point this it it's not always the first time you think about something or think something through that is like the best version of that or the right you know way of doing it so I, I think the best habit I've gotten into is just pausing before clicking send and reviewing. Um, yep. and reviewing. So just make sure you're doing that and then that probably wouldn't happen. And you'll get more used to it uh, the more you are in business and work because that just becomes so common. Okay. Um, I'm gonna give a brief overview of organizing files. Um, this actually, it's funny, you wouldn't really think twice about it, but it saves you so much time especially when you're in a, punch, a pinch. Um, and when I was doing consulting for Deloitte for three and a half years, which I should have mentioned at the beginning, I did that before Wonderkin, um, it was, you would be kind of working late hours, then all of a sudden there would be a client call that would come up your calendar for like 9 a.m. the next morning, and you had just woken up and you just needed to get a file across really fast to your manager for him to present. And if you don't have organized files, that ends up being like a 10 minute task when it could have just been two seconds. So this ends up becoming really helpful. So the first thing I'll say, one of the best tips is just numbering your folders. Um, this allows you full flexibility in controlling which folders go on top. Otherwise it's automatically alphabetically organized and you could name something that you don't necessarily need right away or very often and it would come up to the top just because it starts with an A. Um, like this business case example, normally that would be up here and let's say you don't click into that ever. So it would be very frustrating to have that and it would be hard to figure out where it could be um, if it starts with another letter. Um, titling uh, folders, try your best to use a mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive approach when naming or organizing your folders, which basically means everything in these folders is kind of not related to one another um, and they're distinct and separate. Um, when titling these folders, also use clear and concise names. So you definitely know what's in this versus what's in this one. And then ensure consistency when you're naming your files. So keep it in, the, in a similar pattern. Um, don't start adding things uh, to make it different because otherwise that could add more time to your uh, searching process. Um, this also kind of goes into titling your files. 
Um, you'll find this different in every single, you know, company you work for or team you work for, or project you work for. Everyone has a different style of naming files. Normally what I've been used to is like a name of client and project, name of deliverable, current date, and then current time. This is a pretty pedantic way of doing it, um, but that's kind of what you have to get used to. And that's depending, dependent on your own team and how they, their style. Um, any questions there? Stopped. Okay. And then folder layout. So now that we have the ability to really structure the way our folders flow, what I use, and you can kind of innovate your own way of structuring your own folders, but this is kind of the process and the flow that I like. I like to start with project overview slides. So these are kind of your generic overview context background uh, files. Um, for anyone that gets onboarded to the project, or if you have to revisit your kickoff deck, or anything that looks like that, this is where you would keep it. Um, and that's how you would utilize this, this folder. Um, and it's really, really helpful. The next way I break down my folders is through Workstream. So dependent on the different work streams that, are, that I'm responsible for or that on our project, I'll be able to sort and filter and place files that are related to those in these different categories. Um, again, that comes really helpful uh, because a specific file for a specific, you know, the use cases we'll talk about as its own kind of stream, and then um, the market research will be its own stream, and that way they're not going to kind of mix together, and I, they're distinctly marked in my mind and in my files. Um, next, I would just have project closing documents. So if you leave a project or sunset a project, put anything at your final deliverables, anything that throughout the project came to a close, even if it was an individual work stream and you had one final deck from that work stream, put it in that folder. Um, you'll be you will be surprised, but um, six months from now or whatever, however long it could be, someone could be at that account um, wanting to look back on that project and your findings and they would ask you for it. This is a very handy way of pulling those up really quickly. The last folder I have here, just the appendix. This is kind of what I put everything just into, like any miscellaneous items or ad hoc things. Um, I once had to create like a PTO tracker for my team, I stuck it in there. Um, so this is really just anything that you don't want to necessarily fit into these other buckets that you can place here. Um, okay, so any questions on that? Cool. Okay, uh, soft skills. So I think Peter, you wanna manage this one? Yeah. So working productively with your manager. So essentially there's two things. Uh, well, working with your manager is gonna be one of the most important relationships you build. Um, and you wanna make sure you get this right so that they have trust in you that you're doing the job. And so you can build long-term relationships with these people who are uh, leaders in the firm and can help you along the way. Um, so there's two things I wanna point out here. One is being proactive and one is being collaborative. Um, I'm being proactive first. Essentially, your manager will have such limited time and be spread very thin across ma managing multiple people. Um, your, their, your manager's calendar will most likely look like what you see here, where there's minimal slots that you can fit in um, for little check-ins or meetings with them. So what that means for you is you want to anticipate the needs of your supervisor. You want to predict two days, three days in advance. We probably need to check in on this analysis or we should check in on next steps and act proactively scheduling that and putting that on the calendar will be hugely appreciated so they don't have to track you down. Um, while, their, while their time is really limited though, you should always be updating them on your progress. So it doesn't necessi necessitate a meeting necessarily, but it just could be a short email saying, you know, at the end of the day, what you've been doing and what your next steps are for the next day. And what this does is it just helps them feel comfortable that you're running with it you're controlling the analysis and you're getting what you need from them in case you have any questions. And this makes sure that they don't have to have a tighter leash on you and always overseeing you. It'll go a long way in your career. Um, and then I just say the last point is be realistic about your skills and what you can do. I think this one is really important as a first year associate or analyst. Um, you're going to probably want to go above and beyond um, because you all are high over, uh, over achieve, are high achievers in school and whatnot. Um, I knew I wanted to do this as well. Um, 
but you have to be realistic with yourself. One, what is your skill capability set? And, and two, how much time it's going to take. Because you don't want to go into 3 a.m. every night trying to get an analysis that, that you told your manager you're going to do that they're waiting on. So just being realistic and trying to work plan with them, I think, is really a great thing to do. And they will appreciate that. And it's fine if you're not able to do the huge analysis in that amount of time. And then on being collaborative, I think here it's about building the relationship with them. So, you know, there's two points I want to point out here. One is try to accommodate the preferences and style of working with others. So, I mean, everyone has their working preferences and you'll probably start to find yours as you enter your first job and you continue on. But at the same time, your manager has been working for probably four, five, 10 years, and they know what works for them and have to manage a lot of people. So to accommodate to them will help you reduce some friction. So what that can mean is a manager might be a night person, which means you might have more later meetings um, to, to have. And someone might be a more morning person, which means just send them your materials late at night and they can review in the morning. It's simple things like that um, that add up. Uh, but as long as you can accommodate, it'll make your working style with the manager really frictionless. And then I just plug that you want to get to know them personally as well. It's always helpful to be uh, having a good rapport with your, uh, with your manager uh, so that, you know, when you have a check-in for five minutes, you can chit chat about your weekend and it's not just small talk. It's actually diving into, you know, your personal life and that builds a rapport and that can help fuel long-term relationships like mentorships, which are really key during your first and second year. Um, I know a lot of my managers I work with on projects, I try and build rapport with them and they become my anchors, my mentors and BCG, which help me down the line when I'm thinking about what's my next career step or do I want to go to business school and things like that to provide a fresh perspective. So um, I just really plug that one too. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Do you still have more here? No, no. I think that's about it. Um, I don't know if anyone has questions on that though, but it doesn't look like there's stuff in the chat. So, Awesome. I want to move a little bit quickly here because I want to leave 10 minutes for questions. Um, sure. uh, Work-life balance. So this is actually pretty important and it's kind of funny because even though I'm on PGO right now, I had a call put on my calendar 30 minutes before the welcome reception that I needed to do. So, <laughs> so I'm the great guy to talk about this. Um, but it is really important that you prioritize work-life balance in your life and that you prioritize time for yourself. Um, what this basically means is you have to plan ahead and set personal deadline, deadlines to avoid crazy work hours and be really transparent with your manager over your calendar and when you are expecting to take time off. Um, have a conversation about priorities and obligations outside of work and really be careful about how you prioritize things. Um, mental health ends up becoming a big factor. I know everyone's probably eager to start work and start for adding value and that's great and that you should keep that up. Um, but I know after six months or so, if you only do work, you're gonna start losing yourself into it. And that's a dangerous game to play because your actual value of product will go down. So it's just really important to invest in hobbies and experiences that are distinct from your job Use your vacation time to truly disconnect and limit your join calls, your answering emails, and all of your health and mental health are very important. So if you wanna do a good job or provide a good product at the end of the day, prioritizing you um, some of the time is what's gonna get you there. It's not gonna work until 6 a.m. and then jumping on a call at nine where you can barely even like think. Um, so just make sure you're actually doing that. Um, and then this slide is all about attitude. So you can't really change your personality, but what you can change is your attitude and how you respond to stressful and or not ideal situations. Um, so here are two books that I highly recommend. The first is on mindset and it kind of talks about the importance of developing a growth mindset. So um, when you are growing up, it might be easy to assume that you aren't good at you know, math right? Um, you've never really excelled in that school, and so therefore you're just innately bad. Um, what ends up happening is that you get into this new job, right? And half of the job or whatever it could be is expected for you to run an analysis or do a model. And 
that requires you to have some proficiency in maths and to develop in that, in that skill. Um, so if you were to be tasked with something like that, your knee jerk reaction, if you were having kind of a fixed mindset would be more along the lines of, oh, I don't want that, that role. Like I don't want that work stream, Let's give it to someone else. And that was a bad attitude to the manager. And that shows like that you're not willing to explore. So I want you to, to try to check yourself and be like, am I really using a growth mindset? Meaning that I can, I might not have been good at math in the past, but I can grow in this area and become really proficient. I just have to put the time and work in. So the next one is all about grit and ensuring that effort, if you work hard enough, is overpowers talent. Um, and that, that's that passion and perseverance for long-term goals. So I also highly recommend reading that. Um, okay. And then this is our top five tips for success. And Peter, I want to run through these quickly. Um, just yeah. so we open the floor for questions. So I might just tackle them all. Um, that's cool. Yeah. Um, but the first one is to build a strong and diverse, diverse network. I talked about this in my welcome speech, but it is so important to have a community that supports you, not only for your mental health, but for your professional goals and career. Um, they carry you more than you would ever know. I've gotten this next job, which is incredible and I love it, through all the connections I actually made at Outside of Grad. So it's really important that you do that. Become an effective communicator. It's funny how <laughs> the smartest person in the room might not actually uh, sway any opinions. Um, and that's mostly due to the fact that they can't uh, communicate their ideas and their arguments successfully or efficiently or well enough to uh, sway an opinion. So work on building out those soft skills because they end up becoming really important um, in this next step, the next chapter of your life. Produce high quality work. So one thing I always like to tell myself is if I'm putting my name on it, it better be of high quality. And if you look it to yourself and you hold yourself to a high standard and you look to your name and your brand and you hold it to a high standard, then before you send something out, before you send out that email, um, double, double check it, read it through, make sure there's no mistakes. And if you're putting your name on it, it better mean something. So that's kind of like a good uh, lesson to, to have. Number four, become a lifelong learner. Uh, this is also really important. Never stop developing your skills and growing as a professional individual. Um, I see a lot of people in less demanding industries and jobs who almost stagnate and they stop growing and stop challenging themselves. And that is probably the most dangerous place you can be. If you ever find yourself too comfortable, um, I would ask you to check yourself and make sure that um, you're not falling into that kind of stagnation category. And then the last one here is support yourself and your team. It is so important to stay positive and treat you and your team members well. Um, we all know work gets stressful and people are pushed to meet important deadlines, but providing for your own mental health and that of your team should be number one. Being kind to one another, encouraging one another, even if someone makes a mistake, communicating that in a way that's more effective and, um, and uh, helpful for them to learn instead of a like harsh critique is gonna go a lot uh, longer way. Um, and just have that overall powerfully positive attitude, um, which will lead to success. So went through that fairly quickly. I do want to make sure we do have time. Uh, we have about six minutes left. Uh, so please, it doesn't have to necessarily be about what we went through in this presentation. It can be about anything that you're curious or want help on or nervous about um, this next chapter and this next step. I do see one question from Esteban. How can you communicate efficiently to your manager your need to prioritize your mental health at a given moment, even if it's a busy time? Um, so the one, and I will let Peter speak on this too, but the one thing I found to be most helpful before you're starting a new project or a new team, check in with yourself and say like, okay, what hours of the day do I need to block off for myself? So I always had the time from like, I think it was 7.30 to 8.30 or 7.39 where I needed to go to the gym. If I didn't go to the gym every other day, I would start to spiral and not be able to do good work. So going into that, that first meeting with your new team or your new manager, just setting that standard and setting that expectation be like, I'm so excited to be here. This is gonna be awesome. I just want you to know the way I normally work and operate is I'll take you know, every other day about an hour and a half from 7.30 to nine to go to the gym. It's vital for me to like do this for my mental health um, and to produce good work. 
hopefully you can understand that at nine out of 10, they will if they're good people and be good managers. So just being able to be upfront and communicate that um, clearly has gone, goes a long way for me. Um, Peter, anything to add there? Yeah, I, I, well, I just say that's, that's exactly what you should do and you shouldn't be afraid to voice it. If you don't voice it, then that's when you can get trampled over and your sustainability can go off whack. Um, it's always good to be proactive in communicating that and you're not, you're not crazy to try and communicate that as a first year associate. Everyone should have some time and boundaries that they need for themselves. So I think we also have another question from James across all areas you've covered, what has been your biggest mess up or learning experience and how did you recover from them? Liam, do you have one off the top of your head? I have many, no. Um, that's a good question. I, when I first started, I was pretty helpless. I think we all will be and all are, um, but I made a lot of mistakes. And um, I think the best way that I recovered from them was every Friday after the week, I would kind of log everything that I regretted, I guess you could say, or like mistakes that I had made. And I reflected on them and I said, okay, what am I going to do differently going forward to ensure that this type of mistake doesn't happen again? So that like writing a name on the email that was wrong, that happens when you first start out because you're so overwhelmed with so many tasks and so many things that you want to be quick. Um, but when you're quick, you kind of make mistakes. So, you, so then on that Friday, I would say like, okay, I'm going to slow down and really reread every single email before I send it. Briefly, it's not going to give a lot of time, but just that gut check and then start implementing that new practice. Um, so I would say taking that on as a new habit is incredibly helpful for like learning and growing as a professional. Yeah. I remember, I think one of the biggest mess ups I had was uh, I was a new A2, which is like the second year associate. I just, I just was um, uh, my second year. And uh, I was thrown into a client meeting with like a very senior client and an energy client. And, uh, the MDP team, which is a partner team. And they expected me to run like the full hour meeting, which is, was like throwing me in the deep end. And I just like completely botched communicating the whole message um, because I was overwhelmed. And like, it was my first time really running a meeting and everything. And I came out of that meeting, like wanting to cry almost. I was like, wow, I just really screwed that one up. Um, and the partner who came to me and he was like a very big people developer. And we just sat down and chatted like what went wrong during that meeting. And he was like totally okay with it. He wanted to develop me. And I think over the course of that project, which was three months, we just had active steps to take to improve on my communication and making sure I'm presenting in meetings more so that by the end of the project, I was actually a much better communicator and I feel comfortable presenting slides. Um, so kind of like Liam was saying, taking actionable steps and just knowing that mess ups will happen and just learning from them, I think is the most important mindset that you can have. Yeah. I mean, that's so funny. I, you'll always have those meetings. Um, that's <laughs> far for the course at this point. Like I still have a meeting like once a week where I'm like, wow, that was such a scramble. I was not like coherent or like articulate in that meeting as well as I could have been. So um, yeah. I just have to accept those um, and move forward and learn from them. Yep. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. We have probably time for one more question, right? Yeah, yeah, one more. I don't think we have to do a hard stop at 4:40, um, but I have to. I have to head on over to oh, you do? Okay. Nicole. Let's yeah. just. Did you negotiate compensation? Um, when I first started my career, I did not. It was not standard practice when you go into consulting the first year to do that. Um, Peter, is that same for you? Yeah, it's pretty standard comp. You won't be able to negotiate. Yeah, it, it's unfortunate, but I would say the more experience you get on your belt, then the more opportunity you have, the more leverage you have to do that. Going into this new job, I was able to negotiate and have like a very uh, good conversation around it, um, just because I actually have value now and have like a big skill set to add to to deliver. So um, that's all the time we had. <laughs> I really appreciate everyone, and uh, please reach out to Peter and I with any more questions. The file is actually, this deck is actually in the file tab when you look at your screen. Um, and we'll be around all weekend. So please chat us on Slack and try to find us at the night events and hopefully we'll see ya.